Today's presentation is on the Eastern philosophy proper perspective on life. How should we look at life? It's time now for our beloved holiday tradition. Hey, Jimmy Kimmel, I told my kids I ate all their Halloween candy. Last night I ate all your candy. Why? Because it was good. You ruined my life! <laughs> yeah, we ate it all while you were sleeping. Oh man, I'm gonna eat it all. I'm gonna eat it all. J Jimmy Kimmel said I should eat all your candy. Okay? Okay, I'm gonna eat it all. Yeah, I'm gonna eat it. Okay, this is for me. Well, let's see. Jimmy Kimmel said I should eat this too. Okay. Okay, I think I'll eat it. All of it? All of it. Every single bite? Yeah. You must have a bellyache. <laughs> I got hungry last night. Eat an apple! <laughs> Daddy and I ate all of your candy. Those aren't real drawers, buddy. Get out. We ate all the candy. We'll get some more next time. I ate all your candy. That's okay. Joking, okay? Excuse me. I told you not to. I told you. You can never, ever, ever listen about candy. Are you mad? There's none left. It, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, thank you. So here's the question to be asked after watching the video. Is to be upset about what life has just done, is it optional? Do we have any choice but to kick and scream because life stole our Halloween candy? Or is there a different way of looking at life? So what generally happens is we're going to feel upset or whatever specific emotion you want to use, angry, sad, etc., etc. Because simply put, we are judging how life has unfolded. We look at life, and life has stolen our Halloween candy, and we don't like it, and wah, wah, wah. Now, we're a lot more subtle than those kids are. That one girl who flipped the dish was just, <laughs> was just crazy. But we can't help but judge how life turns out, right? And as a result, we engage in these protests in our own head. Now, maybe you still kick and scream like that. Um, maybe you go floundering around your bed or you drop kick holes in your own ceiling. Or some of the kids in the video, they dealt with it. One kid, he, he took a deep breath and then he's like, it's okay with a big smile. Suffering is going to occur when your ideas about how life ought to be don't match how they really are. So why do we suffer? Because suffering is something that, unfortunately, people are really good at because of the way we look at life. One reason we suffer is we think life is not fair. We become a victim to woe is me attitude. Now, I've been saying this all year. There are some events which will result in you being woe is me and feeling like a victim. 
There are terrible things, shitey things that occur to us. But the question is, does that mindset help? A lot of you actually, at times, are too smart for your own good. You overanalyze. You've been taught to analyze things. And you're ending up like Austin Powers. You get stuck. You're thinking you can figure out a way to get out of this. And if you were in charge, it would have been different. And how unfair it was because Susie got this or Johnny got that. You're not in charge of life. You need to accept you can't over overanalyze what life does. And the third reason why life causes a lot of suffering is life is sometimes just really shitey. I mean, when we talk about Buddhism, the first rule of Buddhism is suffering is part of life. Life's going to do what life's going to do. It doesn't ask our permission. I used the analogy earlier in the year that life is kind of like a garden hose. You need to accept that sometimes that garden hose, when you let it go, you're going to get wet. You can't be in control of everything. You can only control how you think. And so the person with wisdom realizes this phenomena and realizes that life won't always go your way. But most people don't realize this, and that's why they suffer. If you understand that your mind creates the suffering, you will suffer less. I give this example a lot, and kids oftentimes miss the point. The only difference between alone and lonely is how you look at it. Being alone is a good thing for a lot of people a lot of the time. I just want to be alone. Lonely is when your mind says, I wish I was not alone. That's how the mind creates the suffering of just the situation of being by oneself. So today at church, a guy in a suit tried to drown me. And I kid you not, my family just stood there taking pictures. In case you don't know, that's the story of a baptism. But imagine... You know, obviously the kids the kids not gonna know what's going on but think about all day long things that happen to us and how we create drama that's unnecessary and perhaps not even real because obviously the family was taking pictures because it's a great moment not for the little baby who doesn't know why this man is trying to drown him we create drama with our minds and it's because of this drama we suffer our emotional clinging as to how life should be that's what causes our happiness so here's a story, Eastern philosophy story. Um, in some parts of Asia, uh, monkeys are as prevalent as squirrels, in fact, even more so. And some of the monkeys will come into the village late at night where people live, and they will literally steal food and steal stuff. So they try to catch, they try to catch the monkeys. They set up these traps. They take a coconut. They cut a little hole in the top of the coconut. They drain out all the in insides of the coconut. And they put a real nice smelling treat in the coconut, and then they hang it up. It's a trap for the monkey. The monkey comes there at night. He smells the nice treat. He puts his little monkey paw into the coconut. He can barely get it through because they make the hole so small. He grabs the little treat, and in trying to remove his hands, his hand is stuck. Why is his hand stuck? He's holding on to the treat. Now, he has a choice at this point. He's hanging in a trap, hanging by his fist, holding the treat inside the coconut. He could let go, and he would be free. But most of us don't let go of the things in our past. We have emotional clinging for how things should have gone. And because we don't let go, we're not free, we're stuck. We are trapped. The more attached we are to how things have to be, the more unable we are to let go, the more we'll suffer. And by let go, I mean just accept what is happening. There's a line that says, let go or be dragged. Ultimately, a lot of times, we want things to be a certain way so bad. That's what emotional clinging means. We don't realize that we're causing our own happiness, our unhappiness, by how we think. Here's a chart that has nothing to do with anything, but it just amused me. Percentage of chart, which looks like Pac-Man. We'll move on. <laughs> Here's the chart I wanted to make. I made this chart up. Everybody, let's say, 100% of your life will make it a complete circle, because that would be 100%. And in general, when I've asked kids in the past, people will say, yeah, I'm content about half the time. And then a quarter of the time I'm happy and a quarter of the time unhappy. But if I were to ask kids over the years, has it changed a little bit? I've seen the area of the, uh, of the green, the unhappiness, definitely get larger. And why is that? So let's just break it down. Conditions for true happiness. If you're truly happy, life has cooperated. What you wanted to happen, happened. Somebody asked you out, or you got the job, or you won the race, or whatever it is. You're happy. Unhappiness, life has screwed you. You have not received what you want. And then, rather than just move on, you cannot accept what has occurred. You kick and scream and cry. 
Contentment is just rolling with the punches, accepting whatever happens. Acceptance is knowing that the trees can't always be green. It's seeing the beauty in the colors of fall. Now, if you're, all, if you're playing a sport or you're a coach of a team, you want to win and you want to win every game. The acceptance is knowing sometimes it's not going to go your way. And those who can accept it suffer less. Eastern philosophy is more accepting of the present moment, meaning whatever is going on, good or bad, it is. And rather than getting into our minds and daydreaming about something better or complaining about how it is, they just accept it. And by acceptance, I don't mean like just complacent, like giving up. Here's a quote from Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda says, Know that you are the creator of your own destiny. All the strength and support you want is within yourself. Therefore, make your own future. And that's one of the leaders of Eastern philosophy in terms of Advaita Vedanta, which is an Indian philosophy. It's not complacent, saying, oh, just accept what happens. You've got, the, you've got the only keys to your kingdom. You're the one who has to create your own destiny. The starvation model I bring up a lot. Those with the most lows often have the highest highs. They're just not that frequent. So if your whole life, here's what most people do. Their whole life, they want life to do what they want it to do. We, we are very, um, our expectations are out of control. And when things go bad, which they often do, when things, we don't get the way we want them, which often happens, we suffer. And we go long periods of time suffering because life doesn't cooperate. So that because of this scenario, you see the world as not living up to your model of what it should be. And as a result, you're chronically always upset. Every once in a while, the life does do what you want. You know, the old line is a broken clock is right twice a day. Sometimes you're going to get what you want and life's going to live up to your expectations. And it's been so long since it's did that. You are so happy. That excitement is so great. And the reason you're so happy is it's been so long that life did not cooperate. And you have suffered every failure of life to do what you want. And unfortunately, life doesn't cooperate for long, so you get this elastic band effect. When you begin to properly understand how reality works, not with your heart, but with your mind, you'll realize that, you know what, life's going to do what life's going to do, and because of it, your highs aren't as high. And people don't like that. People like the super, super highs. But the reason the highs aren't as high when you have proper understanding, your lows aren't as low. You're not wallowing in misery your whole life. Most people say they want to be happy. The feeling of true happiness is great. It's short. It's fleeting. And it's so short because it doesn't often happen. When you get that hunger for happiness, it isn't as necessary because you're not always unhappy. In other words, if you've been drowning your whole life in misery, a breath of fresh air rising to the surface is going to feel great. But unfortunately, life will change just that quickly. When you kind of realize sometimes I'm going to win, sometimes I'm going to lose, you can kind of sit back. So in a relationship, perfect example. If someone has not been dating for a while and they get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they are so happy they have the boyfriend or girlfriend because the happiness inside of them has come clear. Because for years they were so sad they were by themselves. And then the happiness they fear it's going to leave. And they tend to squeeze the person that they want to stay with closer and closer and closer until sometimes they squeeze the life out of the relationship. You kind of have to just go with the flow in a lot of ways and proper understanding means you're not always going to win. Happiness presents itself before man wearing the crown of sorrow on its head. He who welcomes happiness must also welcome sorrow as they are two sides of the same coin. Now this is an interesting way of saying it, but if you're always try, if you're only going to be happy if life cooperates, well, you're going to be have a lot of sorrow. There are two sides of the same coin. If it's either I get my way and I'm happy, or I don't get my way and I'm upset, well, you're going to be upset. You're going to get a lot of thorns. When we learn to accept whatever life throws at you, good or bad, you can stop like dreading life and ha dr having anxiety. And you can, so to speak, become friends with the present. If you're in a boring class, just be in a boring class. The more you kick and scream that it's boring, the worse it's going to get and the longer you're going to be in there. 
When you just accept whatever happens, you can enjoy whatever life has in store. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. If you remember the Forrest Gump line, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Sometimes you get that disgusting chocolate, whatever it's inside. The, I don't know what that is. Kind of disgusting with the kind of creamy goo in there. And yeah, get to the next chocolate. Move on. Don't wallow in misery. Contentment is a state of peaceful happiness. The art of being satisfied with each day we are given. That's the key thing. Being satisfied that nothing great happened today. I didn't get my way, but you know what? I, I made my way through the day. I understand how life actually operates. Here is a story, Chinese story. So a man had a single horse. The horse was getting older. And so the farmer, he let the horse go. He opened up his gate and the horse ran away. He let him run away to basically finish off his life wild. His next door neighbor came by and said, oh my God, your horse is gone. You must, he ran away. What are you going to do? He did all your work for you. It's going to be terrible. And the man said, eh, you never know. We'll see. A couple days later, the horse came back. And when he came back, 12 other horses were with him. Wild stallions followed the older horse back. And so the man went out to his farm and inside the gate, there were 13 horses. He closed the gate and word got out how lucky this man was who horses came to him. The next door neighbor, nosy next door neighbor came by and said, oh my gosh, what great luck you have. So who has extra horses run home to them? That's amazing. You are so lucky. And the man said, eh, you never know. We will see. Well, the man had a son and a couple days after the horses came by, the son went outside to train those new horses. He got on top of one of the wild stallions and the wild stallion bucked and the, the boy went flying, landed on his leg and broke it into 187 different places. He's maybe never going to walk again. It was a sad story. The next door neighbor came by and said, oh my gosh, that's so terrible what I heard about your son. Just awful luck. I mean, how is he going to get through the days? This is terrible. And the farmer said, eh, I don't know. You never know. We'll see. Well, two and a half weeks later, the Cossack army was invading the town and all of the able-bodied men had to get ready to go and fight. But for the son, he wasn't able to fight because his leg was broken. And the neighbor came by and said, you know what, it was actually pretty lucky your, your son's leg was broken. He didn't have to be in the military because the Cossack army, I heard rumors, just killed all of our men. And the man said, like he always says, eh, you never know, we'll see. We don't know how life is going to work out. We don't know if the bad thing is going to be good or the good thing is going to be bad. When you realize that, much like Piro earlier in the year realized it, life is a lot better. So Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is a film that we will most likely watch. So if you haven't seen Forrest Gump, I don't know. Is he good? Is he lucky or not lucky? He had leg braces. He was made fun of his leg braces, but his leg braces actually made him have strong legs and he got a football scholarship. He got shot in the buttocks, but as a result of being shot in Vietnam, he learns ping pong while in the hospital, becomes a big celebrity, gets a lot of money for endorsing a ping pong paddle. A hurricane comes in and wipes out the entire fleet of ships other than his ship, and he has the Bubba Gump Shrimp Dynasty. That film shows that you never know what you're going to get in terms of chocolate or in terms of life. If I were to ask, did Forrest Gump have a good life or bad life, you would say he had a good life. He met the president, he was a star, he was rich, blah, blah, blah. But then again, his mom died of cancer, his wife died of AIDS, he did not know his, I mean, he was made fun of. It's what you make of life is what happens. You never know necessarily how the immediate outcome of the event that just occurred, you don't know what it's going to do long term. So, as we said, literally first slide, first day, expectations for the future can be a trap. You set in your mind a preconceived model, I can't wait until the party tonight, but Jimmy better be there, blah, 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 and then I'll be happy. And as a result... We miss out on the happiness or the surprise because we use up a lot of the happiness by expecting it. Here's a little bit of a longer story for Eastern philosophy that illustrates this concept. The king of the land said, I want to have a contest to give, give uh, riches to the painter who can paint a picture of peace better than anybody else. And, and painters from all over the land came and a hundred paintings were entered. Some of them were beautiful and others were even more beautiful. And the king finally picked two finalists and he showed them to his subjects. And he said, the first painting was beautiful. It was a waterfall 
and there was a duck swimming with its babies behind it in the lake and there was they were under the shade of a big tree and it was a beautiful sunny day just the picture of peace like the most amazing picture you could imagine and it was beautifully done and all the king's subjects were like oh that one's very peaceful and then the second painting the king showed as a finalist he held it up and his subjects were confused it wasn't a calm scene it was a stormy sky. You could tell the wind was blowing because the trees were blowing and one of the tree branches had snapped and the water wasn't calm and there was a waterfall and water was splashing everywhere. It was very chaotic. It was not peaceful at all. And the king told his men, these are my two finalists. And one of the subjects raised his hand and said, King, I get the first painting. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. The second one doesn't make me think peaceful at all. It makes me think of chaos and storminess and I don't get it. Why? And the king said, look closer, because right below the waterfall, right behind the bush, there was, a, there was a bird feeding its baby. In the midst of all of that chaos, the bird was able to feed its young and not be set in with the, the storminess. And the king explained, life is like this. We wish for peacefulness when everything is perfect, like the first painting, but it doesn't exist. We'll never get a peaceful scene like that. In the second painting, in the midst of all of the chaos of the storm, that mother was peaceful with its child. Because that's what life is like. We have to find that inner contentment or peace within stormy seas of life because we can't control what happens to us. As I've said 10,000 times, do you see the world as it is or do you see it as you wish it were? Most everybody sees it as they wish it were and as a result they suffer. You need to accept sometimes what is. Deep water. Now, deep water, some kids go, ooh, I want to know what this means, and other kids right away write it off, but it's not that deep. Simply put, your opinions, likes, dislikes, judgments, all of your opinions about the present moment is how you're going to create your own reality. If you like the present moment, then you're creating that reality. If you're hating the present moment, you're creating that reality, and then you have to live with that. Ultimately, these opinions in our mind don't matter to anybody but else, but us. We are adding a level of meaning to life that's not naturally there. We're choosing to look at the world glass half empty and creating a reality because of it. Would life be different if we didn't judge the present moment? If we didn't think how it could be better or how much this sucks, if we accepted it, would life be a little bit better if we rolled with the punches? Ultimately, the judging, and this is the, when I say judging, a lot of kids think of like judging one another. I'm talking about judging reality. Because when we judge and then we react to what just happened, we create the drama, just like the child thinking that the priest was trying to drown him and all of his parents were just taking pictures. We create drama through our own perspective. When you learn, get the proper perspective, and look at life differently, you realize you create your own drama and your own suffering because you're looking at life wrong. The drama is, is an illusionary reality that you are subconsciously choosing. You have ultimately this illusion, life is terrible because you're looking at it that way. You have chosen subconsciously to place your own viewpoint on life rather than just accepting it is what it is. Another story. A man had a brand new boat. He was so excited to take it out. He had just finished building it, and he was going to take it out one night uh, to go fishing. In the middle of the night, if, you, if any of you have parents or dads or grandfathers who won't let anybody touch their car, and every weekend they polish it up and wax it, that's how this guy was with his boat. And he took his boat out, and it was peaceful, and he was fishing, and there's nobody on the lake, except there was somebody on the lake. Off in the distance, he saw another boat. And he was just going about his way, and it looked like that other boat was heading towards him. So he yelled out, hey, you over there, I don't know if you can see me, but be careful. I'm over here. No response. The boat kept coming. Man yells, yo, yo, hey, turn your boat, you're going to hit me. No response. The boat continues on, and it hits his boat. And as it hits it, it scrapes against the side of it and hits the boat so hard that the man falls out. The man gets back out of the water. He is pissed. He gets back in the boat and he's yelling and screaming and just yelling all the bad names he can at the man in the other boat. How dare you hit my boat? Why don't you look where you're going? And as he gets back in his own boat, he realizes 
There's no one in the other boat. There's no one to blame. It just is. A lot of times, like if somebody throws a pen and it hits me in the head as a teacher, that's why I hate when kids throw stuff. If a kid throws a pen and it hits me in the head by accident versus if he threw a pen and it hits me on purpose, the only difference is how I view it. Either way, I got hit with a pen. Not the greatest example in the world, but if we have no one to blame but ourselves, sometimes we look at things different. But if we can blame someone else, holy hell, we are going to. The illusionary world that we create is because we are confused. This per confused perspective, Hinduism calls Maya. Maya is the illusion. It's the illusion we create with our imagination, with our thoughts, with our beliefs. It's the drama we create and then have to deal with on our path. Meaning, if maybe we weren't so negative in how we looked at life, we wouldn't create so much drama. Some of you have real situations. And when I, when I say drama, I don't want you feeling insulted that, you know what, you know, somebody died or this or that terrible thing happens. Those things are terrible. But here's the question. Even in the worst events, do we create sometimes worse situation than necessary by how we think of it? Do we make it even more dramatic than it needs be? It's up to us to come up with a way so that we can live life without maybe causing more suffering by how we think. Swami Vivekananda, the cause of all the miseries we have in the world is that men foolishly think pleasure is what we should strive for. After a time, man will find out that it's not happiness, but rather knowledge that we should be going towards, and that both pleasure and pain are great teachers. Well, two concepts, obviously pleasure and pain being great teachers, Everybody wants the good thing, but sometimes the bad thing is, an, is something that will instruct us. But he says instead of happiness, we should have knowledge. Knowledge of what? The reality of life. Like in this cartoon in the bottom, the guy in the beach has been waiting for years for a boat, or, or weeks for a boat. And the guy in the boat has been waiting weeks for lands. And they're both, in about a minute or two, going to realize that what they wished for isn't what they need at all. If we begin to change our perspective and have knowledge that life is going to do what life's going to do, we suffer a lot less. Here's Swami Vivekananda with one of my uh, favorite quotes, which is, when you think of it wicked deep, who makes us ignorant? We ourselves. We put our hands over our eyes and we weep that it is dark. In other words, the way we choose to look at life causes us to suffer because we don't have the proper perspective of how life operates. Another quote from Swami Vivekananda. Our mistakes have places here. Do you believe that you could be what you are today had you not made those mistakes before? Bless your mistakes then. They have been angels you are unaware of. What does that mean? Angels you are unaware of. He refers to as the mistakes. Could be angels you're unaware of. What if you were able to shift your mindset or perspective and embrace as many of the crappy things that have happened in your life. Look at them differently with a little bit of an understanding that they are your teachers, whether they're good or bad. The bad event might have nothing else good about it other than it forced you to mature or grow up or look at life differently. But we choose how we choose to look at life. The proper perspective is take a look at the negative and maybe the negative can be used as grist for the mill or as, in other words, as a way to improve our own self by finding any way we can because the alternative is to let that bad event ruin us. We are what our thoughts have made us, so take care about what you think. Words are secondary. Thoughts live they travel far. Seems common sense, but all day long we have negative thoughts and we wonder why our lives turn out negative. Generally speaking, I think if you can be a half glass full person or if you can realize when the bad event happens, it's just something you need to get through, I think life will be a lot better. So an overview. We've been talking about these concepts for a while, but the nature of suffering comes from your mind, dealing with the past as we continue to draw these things up developing acceptance for what happens to us, trying to actually examine why do I feel the way I feel and is it foolish to feel upset about something that should not not necessarily be, becoming more comfortable with the present, realizing that your expectations will cause you suffering, and ultimately realizing, so you're hopefully not like this kid slamming his head repeatedly into the ground. His arms are kind of rubbery too. It looks He loses elbows for a second when he shakes his arms. 
But when you do realize that you are the only one who will be able to control your own mental world, if you build mental blocks of suffering, you're the only one who's going to be able to tear those walls down. Make sure you write journals, and I will see you all tomorrow.